Today is a very, very special edition where we're talking about infertility. And it's good we hear from, a very, from an expert who has had over eight years of experience on these issues dealing with women with regards to infertility. So today, be ready to ask all your questions. You can share and help someone out there. Okay, Doc. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for joining. Good evening, Seriously, I appreciate Good evening, yeah. So, thank you very much for joining in today. This is a very special edition on Talk Pregnancy with Dr. Nuela, where we talk about pregnancy and other women related health issues. Oh, thank you. Doc, they say best gynecologist in in Cameroon. Doc, that's for you. <laughs> that, okay. That's an overstatement. <laughs> so, okay, that's someone's own opinion for you. So, okay, so like I said, today is a very special edition on Talk Pregnancy with Dr. Nuela. We are talking about pregnancy and other women related health issues. So thank you very much for joining in. And today we are talking about a very important topic, that's infertility. A lot of women have complained about this. So it's very important we hear from a specialist who has had over eight years of experience. She has been dealing with these cases. <clears throat> she has been dealing with these cases a lot. So he, he knows a lot on all this. So today we're going to be hearing from him. And just for a point, this this is actually one of my mentors, and I'm really happy to have him on board. So I'll just leave him to introduce himself before we start. So, Doctor, over to you. Good evening to everyone. I am uh, Doctor Mao Walter Piso. Then I Two thousand fifteen as a gynecologist. I'm also uh, an assistant lecturer in the University of Ghana. That's why I had to teach uh, Dr. Noel, and I'm very happy that she's helping many women through this forum. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc. I think we're really, really happy to have you here. So. So now, the first, we'll start on what is infertility. We have been hearing about infertility. Can we just say someone who has not given birth, just who, who tries to get pregnant for one month or two months, or when do we start talking about infertility in a couple? So, over to you, Dr. Uh, infertility is a big social norm in our environment. And uh, many people have their own definitions. But the definition that is accepted and it's known by we, the specialists, has four principal elements. It means we have a couple who is unable, who is unable to conceive, whereas they have regular sexual contact of two to three times a week over a period of one year, but with no contraception. It means those four elements must be there for us to say a couple is suffering from infertility. It means, as if I, if I may, may repeat myself, they are unable to conceive, one. Number two, they are having regular sexual contact. Number three, it's a period of one year. And the last, they have no contraception they are using. So when we have these four elements, we say, yes, this is a case of infertility. And that definition permits us to start evaluating to see what the problem is. Why is it that this couple is not conceiving? Okay. Please, can everyone get us clearly? Because I'm hearing they say echo is too much. I don't know. If, if you can get us, please give us a thumbs up so that we know everything is okay. 
Yes, yeah, so the um, doctor was just telling us about um, when do you talk of infertility. So in a couple who has just been trying for one or two, let's say six months, you cannot be talking of infertility. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Lily. It's better now. Okay. So we cannot be talking about infertility in a couple who has just been trying for six months. So we need to wait for at least one year before we talk of infertility. I think he has explained it clearly. So, and doctor, you said regular sexual intercourse. What do you mean by, by regular? Is it one, two, four times in a, in a week or in a month? It is averagely two to three times a week. And so okay. generally it is advised to have regular sexual contact in your household because now more and more people have a tendency of only having timed intercourse. But with timed intercourse, the problem is the stress. And so sometimes with that stress factor, the woman can may not ovulate. So it is better to say you have regular sexual contact two to three times a week. And I made most precise that the definition I gave some minutes ago in a couple who is who are where the woman is above 35 years, the evaluation can start after six months of trial. Okay, I hope we have gotten that clearly. So it means that if you are above 35, you know, when they talk about infertility, it's after six months. Okay, does, can you just tell in the rate, what's the rate of infertility? Do you think that it is increasing? And if it's increasing, why? What's the problem? What's happening? Why this time a lot of women are complaining about infertility? Is there something going on? Is there a problem? Uh, that's a very nice question. Now, the rate is on the rise, true. That's true. That's what we have noticed. We have many more women that are coming to consult because of fertility issues. Obviously, the factors that have influenced it is that many women or many couples have decided to delay the time to have their first child, their first child. If you look at the days when our mothers used to still uh, stay in at home, they started delivering very, very young, 17, 16. But now more and more, most women and men want to first of all settle down in society with their jobs or with some investments before they decide to go into uh, for conception. That aside, we have a lot of factors also that are changing in our environment. For example, change in weight. Our population is getting more and more obese. And that's a negative factor for fertility, both for the man and the woman. Even those who have undernutrition, the malnutrition that exists here in Africa also influences it. We have stress, stress from all the ills from our, from our environment here in Bermuda, for example. Stress from your job sites, when you come back to the house, you're so stressed about everything. It has a negative impact on conception. Increase in alcohol consumption, tobacco, and all, and change in lifestyle. All of these have influenced the rate of our of infertility in general. But now to have a clear cut prevalence in our environment is difficult because many women do not come and consult, first of all, for financial constraints. And even when they do come, we ask them exams, they still disappear and don't come back because of misinformation and also because of the constraints of the exams that have to follow. Okay. Wow. So I hope we are hearing all these things. Like, so doc, does it mean that as we are trying and doing, uh, trying to get a career, all these things, what's the advice that you'll be giving to these women now? People want to have their children, they say, no, let them go to school. So with this kind of thing, how will you do? It is true that you, may, you must make a balance between the two. Because one of the factors that is being accepted as uh, that influences concept, uh, conception is age. It is known that between 20 to 30 years of age, 
the girl, the woman or the girl has a higher tendency or higher chance of fertilization or conception. As you start crossing 30 and you get an after 35, that chance starts reducing. That means of fecundability. The capacity, the capacity of you conceiving drops almost by half. By the time you are reaching 40, it goes down again to about 4, 4 to 10 percent, and 45 is almost zero. And so the advice is that when we are trying to look for a career, we should try to put a balance between our career and the desire to also have children in the future. Okay, that's, that's a good one. So I hope to all women out there, I hope we are really listening to all this. We need to balance it because if you only follow the career and at the end, before you want to start thinking of getting pregnant, your chances have really decreased. So um, before we get to some questions, I'd like him to, or like the doctor to tell us the most common causes of infertility. Because from these courses, we're going to, some people are already asking some questions. I'm sure he's going to clarify it from what are the most common causes of infertility. Then before we can go to some of the questions people are asking me. So, Doc, can you tell us what's the most common cause of infertility in our society or in general? What you should know is that infertility has several causes, first of all. And so we cannot talk of just the most important, but there are several, so many causes. But now, if I may take it so that people can understand, we must go from how a woman gets to having a pregnancy. You need a man. So the man has to have good sperms, and obviously he has to have an erection. If you go to the woman, there are several organs that are, uh, participate in conception. It starts, first of all, at the level of the vagina, the cervix, that means the cervix that is the womb, the entry into the womb. You have the womb itself, which carries the baby. Then the one of the most important structures, your fallopian tubes, what is at the sites that conveys both the sperm and the egg. And then finally, you have the ovary. So if we have to put any, all of the courses, if we start from the ovary, the woman that is not ovulating, obviously would not be able to conceive. And there are many pathologies or many diseases that can cause ovulation. And the stress I mentioned earlier, the change in weight I mentioned earlier, the alcohol, the tobacco, and the age all have an influence on your ovulation. Now, if you look at the second, the, after the after the OV, you have the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes has that role to be able to convey the, the egg from the ovary into the uterus and also to get the sperm to go and meet the egg. So if you have a problem with your tubes, there is no road for these two to meet. And so if you have an infection, for example, you have sexually transmitted infections, especially chlamydia and gonorrhea, those two have a very negative impact on your tubes. And also, there are some surgeries that we do that also have an impact on the tubes. They can twist your tubes, they can make it to bend, they can block the tubes. And then at the level of the womb itself, you have now other things that can block at the entrance of the, of the tube, or other things that can impede or stop a pregnancy from fixing itself inside the uterus. And so you have things like fibroids, endometriosis, and all the like. And you have the cervix, if you have had disease of the cervix, infection, and some surgeries of the, of the cervix, you can also have your cervix that can be altered. And you ask me the most common cause in our environment, the most common cause that is acceptable and is accepted by everybody is sexually transmitted infections. As soon as you start having sex, know that you expose yourself to these infections. And if you have no desire to have a pregnancy in the near, in the shortest time possible, these infections can destroy your tubes and influence the chances of conception. Another factor that I've noticed in my consultation more and more are these women or girls that decided to terminate pregnancies at a young age. They call that 
uh, abortion. Yeah, this type of abortion we're talking about is unsafe abortion. It means you decide to remove the, to terminate a pregnancy in a context which is not medically acceptable. And you go and meet people that are not specialized or don't have the competence to be able to do it. And so in so doing, you pick up infections and also it can hurt the womb who is supposed to carry the baby. So those are the two major factors that I've noticed in my consultation that really influence women having uh, infertility. Wow, that's a whole lot, a whole lot of information to many people. And I think you have even answered some questions which some people have been sending here. And one thing he has, he has really emphasized again on sexually transmitted infections and on safe abortion. So these are one of the things which are very, very common in our society. So um, though concerning that, the, the question, Zita, Zita, she asked, um, good afternoon, doctor. Why is it always difficult to conceive after an ectopic pregnancy? Oh, that's a very nice question. Now, ectopic pregnancy, for those who don't know, means that the egg or the pregnancy did not implant in the normal zone of a uterus where it's supposed to be implanted, or implant out of the uterus. So you can have most, the most common site is at the level of the tubes. As I said earlier, the tube is one of the most important structures that helps for women to have a pregnancy. And so general conception is that the pregnancy you have with an ectopic pregnancy most often takes the best tube. And so there's a high chance that you can see have a recurrence of an ectopic pregnancy, but also there's also a chance of you having a normal pregnancy after that. But all of that has to be evaluated to see what was the cause of the ectopic pregnancy you had. Okay. So Zita, Zita, I hope that's understood. And with ectopic pregnancy, it does not mean that that's all for you. They can check the other tubes and see if it's okay. And also, you have to check the cause of the ectopic pregnancy. What happened? And once the cause, which most commonly is this sexually transmitted infection. So if it is present, they have to treat it properly, you and your partner. So it's very important you take that into consideration. If you just have it and you went and you decide to just get pregnant again, and another ectopic pregnancy, or you start having difficulties. So it means that you didn't go through for a general checkup. Then they say, what about the case where you don't have the egg, the egg white mucus during ovulation period? Can you get pregnant if you don't have that egg white mucus during ovulation period? Obviously, yes. Ovulation is the only, that's not just the only sign of ovulation. You should know that the, a woman that has a regular cycle, that means when a cycle is really regular, that means 28 or 29 or 30, it obviously tells you that most likely you are ovulating. Why do I say that? Because for you to have menses, it comes from the normal cycle where you have hormones that are produced. And there are some hormones that are produced from the egg. That means what stays back after the egg has ovulated. That permits your cycle to come to, to return. So a woman that has a regular cycle is most likely ovulating. It is true that there are other ways of evaluating the ovula whether a woman is ovulating. For example, your temperature change, you can have hormone tests that can be done. And then you don't have just, you don't have, not, 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 not just the egg whites, but you have other signs that will tell you that probably you're around your ovulation period. You can have a, un, a unilateral pain on one side. Those are usually signs that yes, you're around your ovulation period. Okay. So it's not only the mucus uh, discharge that we see that we know that we are ovulating. So if you're having a regular 
serious, that means probably you are ovulating all the time. Um, Favor Joy, you've asked a question. I think Dr. already explained that, that is it possible you don't ovulate and can you conceive? He said you must have ovulation before you conceive. So I think that's okay. Then, Doctor, a very, very important question because so many people have been asking about this question. That why, does Doctor, please, can family planning be a cause of infertility after removal? Now, um, the, the, I'll answer it in a simple way. Most of the methods we use for family planning conception that family planning influences conception is not correct. The only method that really delays you from having ovulation is the injectable progesterone method. The other methods do not influence your chances of conceiving. But now your attitude, your sexual activity, after taking the method, can have an influence on your chances of conceiving afterwards. I take an example. If, for example, a young girl of maybe 16 or 17 decides to take a contraceptive method, but now since she knows she cannot have an unwanted pregnancy and forgets that she can still have sexually transmitted infections, she obviously exposes herself to having other cause pathologies that can influence her chances of, uh, of, uh, of conceiving. Emergency contraception just alters, can alter your ovulation period, but subsequently you'll be able to have a conception without any issue. So the message I'm sending through is that family planning is to protect against unwanted pregnancy, but never can it stop you from having, from having, can cause, never can it cause infertility. That way. Okay, well, that's, that's really something that has to be very, very clear to everybody. So using family planning does not cause infertility which many people when they come and start saying I use that family planning and after that one or two years I've not been able to conceive. So we have to check for other things to see what the real problem is. Then Doctor, how about these people who have irregular menses or irregular menstrual cycle? How can they do to know they are, whether they are ovulating or not? Because is becoming difficult, especially those who have their spouse who are not in the same place with them or in the same town, or they don't live together. How can you know your ovulating such that they can plan, have a planned sexual intercourse? Because I think this has also been a very a good a complaint which a lot of women have been sending out. Now, Noela, what I would like to say about this is that you first of all have to know that many of our sisters do not know how to calculate their cycles. And so sometimes they will say they have irregular cycles, whereas it is really not. Because they believe that it should be meant to come on a particular day of the month. But now it is important to know that your cycle starts from the day you start seeing your menses to the day before you start seeing the next menses. That's a cycle. And so I usually advise many women to keep calendars to be able to control and monitor their cycles. That said, for those who have irregular cycles, it depends on the cause of the irregularity. But now, how do we know whether a woman is ovulating or not? We have many tests that we can do. The first one is, first of all, the temperature, the temperature controlling your temperature, a temperature curve which is known, we know that after your ovulation, the temperature has a tendency of rising slightly. Some people, we usually uh, propose to use ovulation test kits. There are case kits that exist in the market that you, you start doing tests some days before your ovulation. As soon as you notice it's positive, it means 24 to 36 hours afterwards, you are going to ovulate. There are also hormonal tests that can be done just after seven days before the next menses, that means around day 21, you can do your progesterone level and then you know whether you have ovulated or not. 
So those who have disorders with irregular cycles, the best thing to do is to go to a doctor and the doctor teaches you how to calculate your cycle so that we are sure that yes, you really have irregular menses or irregular cycles or not. Okay. So we need to know the cost of this irregular cycle, especially in people who have been having their regular cycles and it becomes irregular. So it's very important we know the cost. And please, if you are watching and you are listening, please give a thumbs up, give a thumbs up to our video. Let's share some love to our doctor. And also thank you for joining in this talk pregnancy with Dr. Nuela. We talk about pregnancy and other women related health issues. So today we are talking about infertility and we have a very special doctor with us today who has practiced a long, a long time and he has managed a lot of these patients. So let's give our expert some love, some thumbs up and we will continue. Doctor, please, can prolonged vagina itches like bacteria and fungi infection, can it lead to infertility? That's a very nice question. Yes, it can. Now, um, you should know that the vagina hygiene is very, very important. It also has an impact on the endometrial bacteria flora. Now, when you have the defensive mechanism that is supposed to be in the vagina, in the vagina it means the acidity of the vagina that destroys other bacteria that are supposed to be there. You lose it. You expose yourself to several germs that can cause you vaginitis. That means vagina infections. And those vagina infections increase your chance of having sexually transmitted infections. And so if you have sexually transmitted infections and you do not treat it on time, you expose yourself to having pathologies that can lead to infertility. Well, so it means those who are having recurrent and frequent vaginal discharges, so you can know that it can lead to infertility. So it's important you treat yourself properly. Go and get yourself. It is good. So that you're treated properly. Yes, I think it is better you tell them to go to the hospital. As soon as it starts becoming recurrent, you get to a specialist and make sure it is properly treated because it also ha it has an influence on the possibility and can also have an influence when you're pregnant of you losing your pregnancy. Mm. Wow. Well, I hope we are listening. That's where at least I hope that's clear for you. Then, doctor, another question. What yes, advice please. will you give women who drink for phenol like paracetamol? Basically, three times a week. Can it affect the possibility of them getting pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very nice one. And that's what we see many young girls do. But we know postinol, for some people that are here, postinol is emergency contraception. It's just for emergency. And so if you do not want to be pregnant, why don't you go to a family planning unit? We have so many. Which will permit you to avoid having an unwanted pregnancy. The problem with postinol is that as soon as you use postinol, we should know that it's a hormonal method. And so what happens is that it will alter your cycle. You alter your postinol, it means you've had protected sexual Are you sure you're not picking up infections during that process? If you're picking up infections and you're using postinol all through your life, know that at the moment when you want to... Or the young adolescent, the adolescents, what we usually propose as a contraceptive method is what we call dual protection. It means we need to protect using a condom and another effective method. The dual protection means you use a condom and you use another effective method. Please, the only problem is not just you having an unwanted pregnancy, but the risk of you having sexually transmitted infections 
that can disturb you or alter your system in such a way that you will not be able to have a pregnancy in future. Well, I hope that we are hearing. I hope that the doctor is making everything clear to us. So if you have any questions, drop it on the comment section. The doctor is here to answer you. So don't leave this place with any doubt. Doctor, please, is there any time frame to conceive after an ectopic pregnancy? The time frame depends on the age of the pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancies have different ages. It's true that the most common one, and I think what she's asking, is for the tubal factor infertility. That means the one that the, the one that's in the tube, sorry, the fallopian tube is uh, ectopic pregnancy. Generally, the rule is that the age of the pregnancy for pregnancies that were damaged to abortus is you, you permit the changes to go back to normal and then you can try to conceive so more and more what we, what we some people practice is that as soon as you have an ectopic pregnancy before you have the next pregnancy it is good to go for evaluation with a gynecologist so that they can try to identify a cause of the problem and from there they can advise you on when or how soon you can have another pregnancy but now, as soon as you have the next pregnancy, you must, must go back to your specialist to verify where the pregnancy is. A woman that has an ectopic pregnancy, she has a high chance of having a normal pregnancy. But you must go back as soon as you notice you are pregnant so that they can identify where the pregnancy is and if it's still an ectopic pregnancy they can manage it early enough before you have any complications wow. so it's very important once you have an ectopic pregnancy there are even some people who meet who don't even meet their period and they're already pregnant so in that kind of case you already know that if you just feel as if you are pregnant, just go immediately and let them identify where that pregnancy is so that it should not be another ectopic pregnancy and it should not reach a severe form. Then, just That's what true, Dr. Because there are some who say they are, there are some patients who, or some couples who say they have checked everything and at the end they, are, they say there is nothing that they cannot conceive. What percentage of people have this and what what's happening? They have a chance? Okay, um, that's a very nice question. Now, if I have to give you percentages, they are just averages from many studies, and it is very progressively over time. It is known that when a couple has infertility, the, 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 the statement I've just made, couple, infertility is not the problem only of the woman. It's a problem of the couple. And so women have the tendency of bearing the weight, but we should know that the man also has a role to play. In 30% of cases, the problem is the woman, averagely. In 30% is the man. It means that it's almost equal. In 30% of other cases again, it is both the man and the women. That makes 90%. But now, the rest of 10% is what we call unexplained infertility. It means that we've done all tests possible. The man has no problem. The woman has no problem. But yet, the, the couple is unable to conceive. So it, it occurs in one in 10% uh, of cases, I mean one in 10 women, where you have everything normal, but the couple is unable to conceive. In that type of case, you need to go to a gynecologist for them to evaluate, make the diagnosis of the of the uh, of the unexplained infertility, and propose you other methods to try to solve your problem. Wow. So it's not only a woman's issue. Let us know that. And the men, they always tend to shy away from this thermogram. Doctor, what we really advise, a, a, let's say, a couple that maybe the woman has been coming and say the man has refused to come and check his terms. The man has refused to. What do you even say to this kind? What can you advise to this kind of people? 
these type of people are usually have a tendency of insisting and telling them that the problem is a couple issue. But the thing is that the women have a tendency of wanting to bear the burden on their own. So when they decide, they say they want to bear the burden, I usually evaluate the woman first. And then as soon as I show her that everything seems normal with her, the man most often has a tendency of coming. So I don't drive the woman away saying, uh, saying that no, she can't be the husband. I encourage and encourage. In some cases, I even used to call the man to call on the phone to say, please come, this problem, we should try to manage it together, both the husband and the wife. But now we should know truly, men do not come to consult most of them. They will send the woman forward. Then when the woman comes with all the results normal, that's when they start getting worried, saying that, yes, maybe the problem is coming from them. But I will advise women, when you're going to consult, try to convince your husband or tell them the importance of coming to come and consult together. Because it's a problem you guys bear, both of you, not just one person is supposed to bear the burden. Well, then, um, thank you very much. Everyone, if you are watching this tough pregnancy with Dr. Muella, let's give thumbs up to our doctor because I think all of us, we are really learning. Somebody is saying that these men, they don't like to come to the hospital. They always believe that we, the women, are the cause. So it's very, I hope we are learning a lot. Let's give the thumbs up. Let's give thumbs up to our doctor. And if you have any question, bells will be running or we drop it on the comment section so that you don't miss out on this live show so that at the end you have been you have gone out with no doubt. So um doctor, this um uh, someone is asking that what what are the chances of getting pregnant after an intrauterine device if you have used it for eight years? And you get, is it, can you get pregnant after that? What are the chances of you getting pregnant? Very, very high. If you've not had any infection while carrying the intrauterine device, as soon as, as soon as it has no impact on your chances of fertilization just the next month. But as I said, the problem is that most people, well, as soon as they have a contraceptive method, they forget that they also have, the, you can easily have sexually transmitted infections. And so abandon them to some certain practices. We met multiple sex partners and all the like. So that's what causes that problem, is not the contraceptive method. So as soon as you, you from conceiving, as I repeat again, the only method that may delay you from conceiving is the injectable uh, progesterone uh, contraceptive. That means the depo provera. That's the name that we usually call it, depo, which you take injection on your arm to take for three months. So that one, yes, can, uh, can cause you delayed ovulation and so can cause delay your, your fertility desires, your conception desires. But now the other methods, no. As soon as you remove it, normally you're supposed to conceive. Okay. So if there's a problem after removing it, then you need to go and consult, let them do exams to see what's happening. Okay, then though some women are always, some women usually complain that maybe they are uh, 40, 45, when 40, 45 years old, and they, they say when they want to try to get pregnant, they have only advice on an, I, an IVF, in, uh, in vitro fertilization, that the chances of getting pregnant normally, that they cannot get pregnant naturally. What do you say about this? As I said earlier, your chances of conception decreases with age, both for the woman and for the man. But now, when you cross 40, your chances drop drastically to less than 4% because the quality of the follicles have been, are going to be affected. But it does not, it is not 100% that the woman between 40 to 45 cannot have a spontaneous conception. You can have a spontaneous conception, but it is very rare. And so why people propose that you go for medically assisted procreation or what some people call in vitro fertilization is because the time you are taking to say, okay, no, let me continue trying, continue trying, you are reducing your chances of even success of those methods. 
So generally, even the fertility, the fertility treatment we give, as age advances, those fertility treatments are not the, the, the efficiency or the efficacy of those methods reduce over time. Because past 40, 45, the quality of the eggs you have for you to be able to conceive are also modified. And so sometimes you're obliged to use donor follicles to be able to have a pregnancy. And so that's why 4045, we discuss the two. We tell them that your chances of conception are very low. And so maybe if you've had infertility for quite a long time, the best options will be go to go in for medically assisted procreation, among which you have the in vitro fertilization. But now for those who have financial barriers to do that, we now we advise them that yes, their chances do exist, but they are very limited. Okay. Okay, Doc, thank you very much. What is the time frame for a woman to conceive mm -hmm. after a C section? Now, the, that question is a nice one. The question has many multiple facets. Because normally, studies have shown that any woman, and it's the spacing between pregnancies, average should be about 18 months. Now, the person that's asking the question about the cesarean section is probably asking to know whether during the next pregnancy, will she be able to deliver vaginally? What we consider, or what we take into consideration when we're evaluating a cop, somebody that has a scar who has been operated by cesarean section, to give her a try to deliver vaginally, the child should be the child she had the cesarean, the child she had from the cesarean section should be at least one year of age. If she's at least one year of age before she conceived, then we can try her scar. I mean, we can try to deliver her vaginally. But now, a woman that has a cesarean section, the scar of the cesarean section, six months after the cesarean section, is already strong enough to carry another baby. That's what studies have shown, anyway. But we usually advise that you should have a good spacing between the children to reduce any complications during pregnancy. Okay, though. So we are those who have had a cesarean section. It's advisable that before you want to take in, at least the child should be one year of age, so that you are giving enough time for that child to heal. And with that, you can also increase your chances of having a normal delivery after the cesarean section. So um, someone is asking again, That's doctor, right. is it possible to restore the, the normal vaginal pH after you have recurrent infection? Can it go back to normal even after treatment? Okay, um, the vagina pH, what causes the vagina to have that acidity? It's because you have hormones that are produced in your body. Those hormones break down what is inside the vagina using bacteria. There's some bacteria that's inside the vagina that they call lactobacillus. For those who have done high vagina smear, the OGF C written normal flora. The word normal flora means the normal germs of the vagina. The vagina has germs. And there are those germs or the bacteria that permit the vagina to have the acid nature. And that acid nature now stops other bacteria to come and proliferate or to grow in that environment. And so a woman that has infection and that has been properly treated, the lactobacillus will obviously come back to normal and so will protect the vagina and the vagina will have its normal acidity. Okay. So that means that um, Sasse Alice, I hope that's okay for you. Once it's uh, being treated, once you're being treated, you can your your vaginal pH can go back to normal. So if you're watching this talk pregnancy, but now if I miss like something, around, yeah. Okay, don't yeah. Precise that many women have this attitude of washing the vagina so much, what they call douching. It is not advisable to put your fingers in the vagina because when you do that, you destroy that defense of the vagina. That defense was put there already 
biologically is there to protect you. And so those who have that habit of washing the vagina abundantly will always have abnormal discharge. But a woman that has a tendency of cleaning just outside at the level of the vulva, the finger does not go into the vagina, cleans the vagina, the vulva from up to down, uses, doesn't use a lot of scented soap. You don't have to wash so much with soap. If you do that and you uh, you avoid that, and also your pants must be made of cotton. So if you respect those rules, there's, you rarely come to the hospital to consult that you have a problem with your vagina or you have vaginal discharge. Okay. So we, we don't advise douching. When you start douching, you, you take, you actually yes, destroy the normal vaginal flora. So it's very important we take this into consideration. Every woman, you don't have to send your hand inside your vagina. You just wash outside with clean water. So if you're watching this talk pregnancy with Dr. Nuela, and today we are talking about infertility, and we have a special guest on board who is an obstetrician gynecologist who has been working for over eight years. So it's very important today he is coming to give us knowledge. And so, please, we are running off. Just send your last questions and give thumbs up to our video so that we know you're appreciating our doctor who has taken the time to come and educate us today. So, um, doctor, one, before you give your final, maybe like the last word or advice to women, women who come or couples who come to actually complain about this activity, what are the things that you take into consideration? What are the things that are, they have to ask them? Or what's the general like overview of what you're going to do to a woman who comes to infertility or couples who come for infertility issues? Okay, so we go in steps. The first thing is, first of all, to get the history. The history means, the gynecologic history means the type of gas, when, when she started seeing her menses, how it's her cycle, how does she have any problem with the cycle? We go through her sexual activity, the risk factors of having sexually transmitted infections, the disease she's had, and then we move down to make sure that she has no other disease or she's not exposing herself to some social but social norm social uh, social uh, exposures like alcohol tobacco and we ask questions also about the husband we check also the husband's history and all like now after a thorough history checking about all the gynecology the number of children what happened to the children and then the husband we now go now to verify we examine her make sure that we do not if there's something we're not missing we examine the breast examine the genitalia the organs to see whether you have a morphologic cause of the problem thereafter the next step will be to verify if she's not been in contact with any sexually transmitted infections. After verifying sexually transmitted infections for both, we now move now to verify how is um, the tubes, like what they call hysterosarpingogram. They call it X-ray of the tubes. And you also do an echography to see how the womb is, as well as the ovary. And uh, for the man, you do the sperm test, what they call semen analysis. In some cases, you can do a hormone test, hormonal profile to check whether she has any hormonal pathologies that can influence her ovulation. And so when we finish all of this evaluation, at the end of that, we can have an idea of what could be the cause of the problem. And so if I may say, we go system by system. Ovaries, we verify if she's ovulating. The tubes, we do an X-ray to verify that the tubes are, are going through without any problem. The womb, we do an echography to see whether there is no mass in the uterus. The cervix, we examine to make sure the cervix has nothing abnormal. And then the man, we verify the semen analysis and we verify that he has normal erections. And then last of all, we evaluate to make sure that the couple is having regular sexual contact. 
And so when we do that, we already have a global view of what's happening after easily pinpoint a cause which we can treat. Okay. Wow, wow. I hope we have all learned so much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um so anyway, we'll get to that when you have to you have to tell us where we can contact you. People want to get to you to know where you are, if you have a private clinic or how they can get to you. So you're going to tell us when you're giving your final statement. So please, if there's any, any questions, let's drop it down. And even after that, we can drop it on the video and we can come and give you an answer to that. So uh, someone is still on the issue of ectopic pregnancy, whether scanty menstruation is also an effect. If someone had an ectopic pregnancy before, can the person start having a scanty Men the menses is not longer the same as it was. Okay, that's a nice question. Now, scanty menses is a different topic on its own that also can have uh, the cause of the scanty menses can have an influence on you having a medical pregnancy. When we say scanty menses, what we mean is that the hormones that are supposed to be bleeds are not being are not doing their job properly let us say it like that and also the room where the blood is supposed to come can also have a problem so if we have to go to all the hormones first of all the hormone that makes you to have very many menses for you to bleed is what we call estrogen and so a woman that is stressed up that is obese that has um, the breast that is flowing continuously, those who have thyroid disease, will obviously or have low, if those who are even obese or have a low, very low BMI, that means they are really very small, will always obviously have a problem with their cycles. Now, with respect to the endometrium also, where the womb, the baby is supposed to sleep, you can have those who have had repeated abortions, those who they have been cleaning so much all the time. They can go and destroy those layers there, and so the woman will not be able to have it. Cause problems for you to be in when you're pregnant. But now, an ectopic pregnancy per se does not influence your scanty menses. The scanty menses needs to be evaluated by a specialist to see what the cause of the scanty menses is, and then they try to solve it. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, so, um, I think we're running. Doctor, just one last question. Are there some specific diets yes. you have to take to improve your fertility? From diet, that is particular diet. Now there are many, there are many, there, yeah, there are many multivitamins that are out in the market, and most of these vitamins have an influence on your ovulation, have an influence on motility of the sperm, that means the way the sperm moves, and so some there are a lot of supplements that do really help with that with uh, fertility issues but now a woman that has a balanced diet also has the chance of having uh, these vitamins that are that will come from the diet and so if you have a balanced diet you keep a good weight your chances of fertility are very good but now if you don't have that or you don't have access to that if you have those uh, fertility pills which are called multivitamins with omega-3 vitamin e vitamin d a it can be of help both for the man and for the woman because it really help in, uh, in the ovulation and also in sperm production okay wow wow we are already coming to the end thank you very much for everyone who joined marie atanga zita zita sakwe alice lily love favor joy thank you all and esteem thank you all for joining and doctor just one last word to all these women what can they do or this couple outside who have been suffering from infertility what can they do or what their last advice 
what like just the best advice you can give to them. Okay, for the very young, I will start by saying, please, you have to try to protect yourself against sexually transmitted infections. You have the condom, and you can have uh, you are, you have the other contraceptive methods that will also now protect you against unwanted pregnancies. We should know that when you have an unwanted pregnancy and you decide to terminate the pregnancy, you are jeopardizing your future possibilities of having another pregnancy. For so the young ones, I will tell them to use contraception and if they have a pregnancy which is unwanted it is good to go to the nearest health center for counseling not to say okay let me go and terminate the pregnancy i want to use any methods just know that as soon as you terminate it you are jeopardizing your future for the couples that are suffering from infertility the time frame for you to start going to the hospital is one year for those who are above 35 years, after six months, get to a doctor so that they can check to see what is happening. But now, as soon as you start consulting, my advice is that you consult a gynecologist. We are many, there are many gynecologists here in Bamenda, and there are many out of Bamenda. So go to a gynecologist and start your consultation. And what we have noticed also is that many have a tendency of moving from one gynecologist to the other, one gynecologist to the other. Please, you should inform yourself about the pathology before you go to your gynecologist. And what your gynecologist tells you to do, it is advisable to respect what he is telling you to do. Because the more and more you go round and round, you'll be spending a lot of money and staying on the same spots. Infertility management is a continuous process. You start from the basic in, uh, tests. When they see the disease that is causing the problem, they will try to solve it. But now there are some diseases that cannot be sorted out easily. And now the only option you will have is to go for what we call test tube babies, what we call in vitro fertilization, or another method is medically assisted fertilize, uh, medical assisted procreation. So please do not always hesitate as soon as they tell you that this is what you have to do next. You going to traditional doctors to try all those other things is only making you spend a lot of money. It is advisable to follow what the gynecologist that is following you up advises you to do than spending a lot of money left and right from one gynecologist to the other. So try to keep to one gynecologist and take to the end with the follow-up. That's what I can say. Wow. Thank you very much, Doctor. We are already at 15, 12 minutes past five. So it's showing that it was very, very interesting and many people still have a lot of questions. But you just drop it on the comment section. After that, we can see come and answer your question. And doctor, please, where can they get, how can someone meet you? Just tell us where, some, if someone is in Bamenda now and wants to see you, where can they see you, when and where? It is true, I have, um, I have a program where I work at the regional hospital. I consult on Wednesdays and on Fridays in the morning. There's a big workload. Obviously, if you have to come, you need to book around the room. Sometimes I uh, have some private practice I usually do at people's clinic. But I would prefer people to come at the, at the regional hospital, book around the room, and I'll be able to see them. So thank you all so much for joining. And I really appreciate you, Doctor. Thank you for honoring this invitation. I'm really glad, and I think he has gone a long the way. The pleasure is all mine. Out there who have been having this, uh, this kind of complaint. So thank you very much, and God bless yeah, you all. Thank you, Dr. Noella.